Section 37 of Christmas and Christmas Lore. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christmas and Christmas Lore by Thomas G. Crippen. The Lord of Misrule. Stowe the Antiquarian, died 1605, tells us that anciently there was in the king's house, wherever he lodged, at the feast of christmas a lord of misrule or master of merry disport and the like also there was in the house of every nobleman of honour or good worship whether temporal or spiritual among them the lord mayor and sheriffs of london had their several lords of misrule ever contending without quarrel or offence who should make the most pastime to divert the beholder these lords began the rule or rather misrule on all hallows eve and continued the same until Candlemas Day, in which space there was fine and subtle disguisings, masks, and mummeries, with plenty of cards for counters, nails, and points, in every house, more for pastime than for game. The date named seems to give countenance to a conjecture that the Lord of Misrule was in some way an impersonation of the malignant power that was supposed to rule, or misrule, the inverted year the season of storms and frozen streams and leafless trees not of course the actual devil but the spirit of winter the blind god hoder the touch of whose spear had slain balder the beautiful god of the summer sun this it may be said is somewhat far-fetched but it is certain that in those districts where the population contains a large scandinavian element the yuletide merrymakings had a good deal of heathenism in them in the north of yorkshire for example it was usual in the early part of the seventeenth century to dance in church after prayers on christmas day and throughout the holiday a little earlier in queen elizabeth's time the lord of misrule and his crew are said sometimes to have invaded the church and thrown the service into confusion in fifteen seventy six archbishop grindal issued certain articles of inquiry applicable to the whole province of canterbury one of them was whether the minister and church wardens have suffered any lords of misrule or any disguised persons or others in christmas or at may games or any morris dancers to come unreverently into the church or churchyard and there to dance or play any unseemly parts with scoffs jests wanton gestures or ribald talk namely in the time of common prayer Nine years later, the Puritan John Stubbs wrote in the Anatomy of Abuses as follows. The wild heads of the parish, flocking together, chose them a grand captain of mischief, whom they ennoble with the title of My Lord of Misrule, then marched through heathen campaign towards the church and churchyard, their pipers piping, drummers thundering, their stumps dancing, their bellies jingling, their handkerchiefs swinging about their heads like madmen their hobby horses and other monsters skirmishing among the throng and in this sort they go to the church though the minister be at prayer or preaching dancing and swinging their handkerchiefs over their heads in the church like devils incarnate with such a confused noise that no man can hear his own voice then the foolish people they look they stare they laugh they fleer and mount upon the forms and pews to see these goodly pageants solemnized in this sort it seems convenient to mention in connection with these disorders a yorkshire custom of shouting yule at the end of the christmas morning service this may explain the origin of a nonsense rhyme which can be traced back for several centuries but to which no rational meaning has ever been assigned yule 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 three puddings in a pool crack nuts and cry yule in some towns and villages a master of the revel appears to have been publicly appointed to organize the parish festivities in great houses where a professional jester was kept the business was usually assigned to him in the colleges at oxford perhaps also at cambridge the fellows appointed a member of the college usually a master of arts to regulate the proceedings of the twelve days in the inns of court his function seems to have been rather to stimulate than to regulate he was called by various names at merton college oxford he was king of christmas at trinity he was emperor in many places he was the christmas prince 
but more commonly the lord of misrule and in scotland abbot of unreason he was somewhat analogous to the mock king of the roman saturnalia his function being to organize the sports and keep up a continuous round of merriment at least from christmas eve to twelfth night he maintained a mock court and assigned to each one an active share in the business of merrymaking in a great house or at court he was well paid for his pains on one occasion henry the eighth paid fifteen pounds six shillings and eight pence to his lord of misrule equal to at least two hundred pounds of our present currency at other times wealthy men seem to have assumed the function at their own cost for the entertainment of the guild society or town in which they were especially interested in the sixteenth and early part of the seventeenth century the inns of court appear to have arranged their christmas festivities with a total disregard of expense in fifteen thirty five a mr francis vivian who was christmas prince of the middle temple is said to have spent the equivalent of two thousand pounds in this manner during the twelve days of christmas he maintained all the state of an actual sovereign dined daily in the hall under a cloth of estate being saluted by his chaplains in church with three low bows receiving petitions which were handed to his master of requests and finally conferring several mock knighthoods the following are the titles assumed by one who played lord of misrule before queen elizabeth in fifteen ninety four the high and mighty prince henry prince of purple archduke of stapula and bernardine duke of high and nether holborn marquis of st giles and tottingham count palatine of bloomsbury and clerkenwell great lord of the cantons of islington kentish town paddington and knightsbridge knight of the most heroical order of the helmet and sovereign of the same the merry disports of the elizabethan age were characterized by much splendor boundless extravagance a considerable amount of humor and occasional cruelty this is scarcely to be wondered at in a time when cock-fighting and bull-baiting were quite usual pastimes and bear-baiting was deemed worthy of royal countenance and patronage we have a detailed account of the daily feasting and merry-making by the members of the inner temple during the twelve days of christmas of one elizabethan christmas on st stephen's day immediately before dinner there was a pageant in the hall in which various great officers of state were personated these were attended by sixteen trumpeters and four drums and fifes with other subordinates when these great officers were seated at table there came in the master of the game in green velvet and the ranger of the forest in green satin each bearing in hand a green bow and divers arrows with each of them a hunting horn about his neck blowing together three blasts of venery these having marched thrice round the fire which was evidently in the middle of the hall took their seats then came a huntsman with a fox and a cat in a net and with them nine or ten couple of hounds and forthwith the fox and cat were worried to death by the hounds with blowing of hunting horns after this merry disport the company proceeded to dinner more respectable probably less costly and certainly more conducive to honest mirth was a pageant exhibited to the town folk of norwich in sixteen forty by one john gladman or by another account hickman being crowned as king of christmas he rode in state through the city dressed forth in silk and tinsel preceded by twelve persons habited as the twelve months of the year and followed by lent clothed in white garments trimmed with herring skins on a horse with trappings of oyster shells in token that sadness should follow and a holy time in this way they rode through the streets accompanied by many in grotesque dresses some in armour carrying staves and occasionally engaging in mock combat such as devils chasing and frightening the children and some in skin dresses counterfeiting bears wolves lions etc and endeavouring to imitate their voices this is the latest christmas pageant of which we have any detailed account prior to the temporary ascendancy of puritanism it is easy to understand that in an age when refinement was only to be found in a very limited section of the upper class when the manners of the common people however merry and picturesque were on the whole extremely coarse 
such organized revels would be apt to degenerate into rude practical joking and horseplay and would generally tend to relax the bonds of official morality it is not therefore wholly surprising to find a statute of the scottish parliament passed in the year fifteen fifty five wherein it is statute and ordained that in all times coming no manner of person be chosen robert hood nor little john abbot of unreason queens of may or otherwise neither in burg nor in landwart in any time to come provosts baileys etc electing such personages were to lose their municipal freedom for five years electors not in burgs to be fined ten pounds and be imprisoned during the queen's pleasure and the acceptor of sick like office will be banished forth of the realm after the restoration the lord of misrule seems to have a temporary resuscitation at the inns of court evelyn tells of being invited to the solemn foolery at lincoln's inn on the first of january sixteen sixty two and pepys mentions the presence of the king there on the following day but the revival seems only to have been transient many defunct elements in the old-fashioned christmas we may view with sentimental regret some we may hopefully endeavour to revive as we have already welcomed back the queen of the may but we would shed no tear over the lord of misrule or abbot of unreason let him rest in peace if there were aught for us to wail twould be his resurrection End of section thirty seven